your intellect, strength for your spirit, balm for your heart. The Healing and Peace Show with Thomas Schmier, LMFT, where you get wise counsel based on sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and sound science. The Healing and Peace Show, your Catholic guide through the trials of life. Do you suffer from brain fog, attention deficit disorder, anxiety, or depression? Or have you been diagnosed with hypertension, cardiovascular disease, or type 2 diabetes? Do you want relief from one or more of these problems, but don't want to take drugs or have surgery? Today's guest is a medical doctor who explained how you can get better without going to the hospital. He's a New York Times bestselling author and creator of the Nutritarian Diet. Dr. Joel Furman, welcome to the Healing and Peace Show. Thank you. Great to be here. I found you when I was doing one of my hobbies, which is watching strange and unusual documentaries. I have a lot of fun doing that. And I watched Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead over six years ago. And you just happened to be taking the blood measurements of the person who was in the documentary. And I'm just a research kind of guy. So I said, who is that, Dr. Furman? I went and looked you up, found your book, Eat to Live, read that book, made sense, asked my wife to read it, made sense to her, got on the nutritarian diet, never looked back. Uh, you really changed my life. It's easier to bend over and pick up things, thanks to you. Uh, lost about 40 pounds, never was hugely overweight. Uh, but what has drawn me to you has a lot to do with my therapy. My therapy is based on the best of faith and evidence-based treatments. And I think you have the best evidence-based diet plan for, the, for not just the brain, but for the body. And so I'd like you to make a case, make the case that you have the best evidence-based diet uh, compared to any other ones out there. Well, that, that's right. You know, my, my niche is to give people what's ideal. There are lots of people's advice there to try to sell books or get popular based on what people want to hear, what they want to do, what's going to, the masses will accept. But I'm just focusing like a, you know, focusing like a laser on how to slow aging, extend human lifespan, and push the envelope of longevity. You do that when you idealize micronutrient intake. You do that, then you have a diet style that's most effective therapeutically to reverse disease. So people can get rid of their diabetes, not control it, but not have diabetes anymore. Get rid of their, normalize their blood pressure, normalize their cholesterol, not have any heart disease. What I'm saying is our bodies naturally are a miraculous self-healing machine. Cancer and strokes and dementia and heart disease are not natural. They're not the inevitable consequence of aging. They don't have to happen to people. And I'm showing people the way which they don't have, they can take that opportunity, which is a which is an unprecedented opportunity in human history. That nutritional science has made these advances that we can use science to discern, check every box that makes for better health utilizing the full portfolio of anti-cancer superfoods in a diet to be able to protect ourselves and have a better, happier, and healthier life. And to, so I, to start out with you saying make the case, let me just say that the most proven methodology to slow aging and extend human lifespan is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. That means every strawberry has 700 nutrients in it. Every piece of broccoli has a, lot, has a host of undiscovered elements. The most active ingredient in broccoli that makes us live long is broccoli, because it's like, it's, it's so too complicated for us to understand what I'm saying is that, but we can, so these micronutrients include thousands of phytochemicals and antioxidants that we use to keep free radicals from forming in our body and their immune system can utilize to repair broken DNA crosslinks remove toxic waste products, and to slow the aging process by activating those anti-aging proteins like CERT1 and AMP kinase. In other words, the, the body has the ability to maintain telomere length and maintain the integrity of its DNA and live a long, healthy life. And we're just learning about this 
in the last few decades, but very few people are taking advantage of this. So we're talking about a diet that's rich in plant in natural plant material, and I have an acronym called GBOMBS, G-B-O-M-B-S, which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. In other words, have people have it on the tip of their tongue, those foods with most proven scientific literature to prevent cancer and the same and to activate our body's self-healing mechanism. And my 30 years as a physician now, utilizing a nutritarian approach, taking care of very sick people, so that people get, got rid of their lupus, their psoriasis, their autoimmune hepatitis, their ulcerative colitis, their multiple sclerosis, that these diseases that plagued them and that they were told were irreversible and it'd have to be on toxic cancer-causing medications the rest of their life, were shown that they, they got totally well and didn't need drugs anymore. So that's been the most fulfilling and rewarding part of my career is taking care of people who were ill and they make radical recoveries and getting their health back. But you and I know that this is the healthiest way to live just to prolong human lifespan and be happy. Exactly. I've read a lot of your books. I have just some of the books of yours that I own here. And you can wow. see yes, Fast Food Genocide. Fasting and Eating for Health, uh, Super Immunity, The End of Dieting, and of course, Eat to Live. And then that's, I don't have my cookbooks here either from you. Uh, now, what I like about your books are the citations, and I like that about your articles, are the citations. And you don't have just the same citations you can find in competing uh, books uh, about giving advice on diets, uh, dieting, uh, what to eat, nutrition. But what you have are You know, it's from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. These are peer-reviewed scholarly articles, and they're putting one type of food against another type thing, double-blind placebo. Uh, can you explain a little bit about um, which types of articles are more valid or more convincing than others? Sure. You know, that, that's right. It's a good point you just made was because you could have anybody come on the air on a radio show or a podcast and say anything. We know there's a hundred diets out there. Why are they, you know, and I'm saying that right now to be clear that for a diet to be ideally extend human lifespan, it has to be the vast majority of calories, probably at least 90% close to, or 95% of calories from unrefined plant foods, not, you know, not processed foods. Right now, the American diet is 60% of calories from processed foods and 30% from animal products. I mean, I think all nutritional scientists recognize today that, you know, white flour and honey and maple syrup and donuts and cookies and crackers and rice cakes and white rice and even oils are processed foods that shorten our lifespan. But I'm saying right now, three things. One, when we take in calories without nutrients, we shorten our lifespan. We take in processed foods, there's no calories. Number two, animal products do not contain phytochemicals and antioxidants, and they drive hormones like IGF-1 into levels that are too high, which accelerates aging and promote cancer, and they promote inflammatory compounds. So we have to lo lower processed foods and animal products in the diet and eat more natural plants. Now, how come somebody could say, well, let's eat more animal products, and that's a better diet? So I'm saying, well, we have to know what makes one study, why do we give one study more credence versus another study? We give a study more credence if it has large numbers of participants, thousands of people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, number one, large number of participants. Number two, it goes on for decades, the study, not just for a few years. And number three, we look at hard endpoints. A hard endpoint is death, heart attacks, cancer, you know, cancer diagnosis or cancer death. Those are hard endpoints. In other words, I can put you on a diet of nothing but Twinkies. And you get sick of eating Twinkies, you'll cut back on your calories, you'll lose weight, your triglycerides look better, your diabetic number might look better, your waist measurement improved, your body fat improved. Those are soft endpoints. It may result in longer life, but we know that a Twinkie diet, whether you lost weight and your blood tests looked better or not, is gonna shorten your life precipitously. You can snort cigarettes, you can smoke cigarettes and snort cocaine to lose weight. You know, it's not gonna make you live a long time. And what I'm saying right now, is those high protein diets like the paleo diets and the ketogenic diets 
have at this point in time been well investigated in the scientific literature. So we have long-term studies on those type of diets, seeing what happens to people when they're 20 years or more following a diet with a higher amount of animal product, products in it. They might, have, they might have accommodated some people to lose weight and had some short-term benefits over a year or two. When we look at long-term, there's much higher heart attack rates, there's higher all-cause mortality, and it cuts short people's lives to be on a higher protein diet. Thinking of a recent study that had over 44,000 um, women, 44,000 women, they followed them for more than 20 years, and they classified them on a scale of zero to 20, zero being no animal products, mostly vegetables, mostly plants, 20 being like a, an Atkins high paleo diet where they're eating mostly meats and animal products with no, no significant plant carbohydrate matter. And they found that cardiovascular death went up 5% for every two point, two, score, two point score going up the scale of animal product consumption. I'm just using that as one example. Another recent study with 6,000 people, 18 years, 50 to 65 when they started the study, had a fourfold increase cancer death over the 18 year period and a 75% increase overall death comparing the lower tertiary of less than 10% of calories from animal products to the higher tertiary, which was more than 30%. You know, so I'm just giving two studies as an example. But what I'm saying right now is every study, all of them that look at heart endpoints over decades show that more unrefined plant foods make for longer lifespan. So we're really, so I think most nutritional scientists in the world today, including the World Health Organization, is now putting out the idea that we have to eat more nuts, beans, greens, berries, you know, fruits. In other words, that we have to eat more colorful plant material and get the processed food out and, you know, and radically ratchet down animal products. So we're really, um, more and more people are getting on the same page, but there's so much noise out there and so much confusing information that people don't know who to listen to. One thing I like about you is you don't let ideologies get in the way. You, you, you don't, your only ideology, if it's not even an ideology, is I'm going to use, take the, what the wide body of scientific evidence says, and I'm going to report that to you and help you have tell you what the optimal diet is and let everyone else figure out their ideologies. And for that reason, you are not allowed to speak at certain places sometimes. You know, for example, uh, you would think the vegan community would just totally embrace you, but because you allow for animal products, you know, just a, a limited amount in your diet based on the science, you're getting, you don't always get invited to the, to the vegan uh, conferences. Sometimes maybe you do, but sometimes not. Yeah, um, you know, I think what happened in some of these um, vegan conferences, because, you know, I allow, I advocate people follow a nutritarian diet, which may be vegan or may include up to 5% of calories from animal products, because we don't know for sure. And some people actually do better with a little animal products in their diet than on a vegan diet based on individual differences. You know, but whatever that reason might be, maybe their brain needs more cholesterol and they start to get depressed. But Whatever the reasons are, some people do better with a little bit of animal products. And if, if you're one of those people who need some animal products, I'm still insisting it should be held to very low levels because you can't because too much animal product in the diet, even if you feel better on that kind of diet, could be dangerous for you. But I think one of the main reasons that um, certain of the vegan conferences have um, don't include me in their speaker list is because I've recommended people use nuts and seeds. Yeah. So what I was saying is that. Um, that I think the reason why that some of these conferences did the, some of these um, leaders in the vegan movement who've been advocating a diet with no nuts and seeds, thinking that lower fat is better, and by advocating a diet with no nuts and seeds, the, the overwhelming evidence in the scientific literature, even in the Adventist Health Study 2, Adventist Health Study 1 published in 2001, so that vegans without nuts and seeds in their diet live shorter lifespans than vegans with nuts and seeds. And even people who included animal products who ate nuts and seeds lived longer than the vegans did, who didn't eat nuts and seeds. So the vegan diet became, so in other words, that um, inflamed some people's legacies because they've been advocating no nuts and seeds. They didn't want to have the conflicting evidence with it. But I think that um, now the evidence has been so overwhelming, including the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study 2, with more, you know, with 88,000 participants published in 2018, showing that in the highest quintile of nut and seed consumption, they were living, they had a 39% decreased risk of cardiovascular death. 
Again, large numbers of people, long studies, hard endpoints. You know, people are in denial. They just they're so affected by their own personal biases and what they said in the past. They can't redefine or rechange what their initial um, programs were because their egos get so involved. And there's been an ego war of people wanting to exclude anybody that disagrees with them. It's crazy. Plus the fact that a lot of these vegan gurus take risks with people's brains and lives. And I don't want to take, play games with people's life. In other words, on a vegan diet, it's not just that B12 you may be deficient in B12, which may damage your brain. Is a lot of people on a vegan diet get deficient in DHA, which could shrink the brain and cause dementia and increase a person's risk of depression. And by making believe a vegan diet is perfect with no supplemental need, extra supplemental needs except B12, is taking risks with people's brain health and is and is irresponsible. And me and myself and outwardly saying that these vegan gurus are potentially blood test or supplement with EPA and DHA in a vegan diet, but you don't want to take a chance with brain shrinkage. Once your brain shrinks and you're 80 years old, you're not going to grow it back again. You can't like, you know, it's not a question of proving who's right. The evidence is overwhelming here. And if you don't think that the evidence is overwhelming, maybe think it's a hard decision to choose on, then err on the side of caution. Don't err on the side of becoming demented. So I can give that as an example. But I think it's the fact that um, my experience being more cautious and being somewhat critical of some leaders in the vegan community, how they've used their power to exclude me from some of those events, which is fine with me. There's plenty of other events since it's speaking on, but it's just a shame that people are sometimes damaged by bad information. That's the most important thing, is getting the right information out and making sure people aren't, um, you know, adhering to this, these, these advisors like religious figures, and they just take what they say and don't look into the science and just, and, and they're possibly hurt by it. Some other people who would definitely cast you out would be those who favor a ketogenic diet, uh, it, you know, a diet basically high in fats, you know, but fat just, uh, I don't know if it's animal fats or, you know, dairy or, or what it is, but fats. And I, I've met individuals who claim they gotten rid of up to five symptoms from using a ketogenic diet. Why would you say that the ketogenic diet is actually inferior to yours, even though there seems to be some success when people use it in treating symptoms. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's we're going back to the same thing, short endpoints versus long endpoints. In other words, um, the American diet is so bad, so obesity you know, causing, in other words, so high glycemic, and then of course it's full of saturated fat. It also blocks the insulin receptor, increasing insulin resistance, but a combination between the, the animal foods and the processed foods at the same time with so much high glycemic carbohydrates. You take the glycemic carbohydrates out, people lose weight and do better. You know, so it's not a quite, it's somewhat, um, nevertheless, the point is what happens to these people long term. As a primate, we're, a, we're, we're built and we're di biologically designed like a frugivore. We can see color, we can taste sweet, we were built, you know, we're somewhat designed like the great apes are. And that, and our body is not designed to handle all the acid in animal product production. Also, when we eat more animal products, we increase the gram-negative bacteria in the gut that produces TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, which then has a pro-inflammatory effect on brain tissue and make an increased risk of dementia. And it also increases risk of endothelial inflammation, strokes, and heart attacks. That's well established. And excess animal products cause, of course, I, high IGF-1. Now, to make the diet ketogenic, you have to restrict carbohydrates, grams of carbohydrates you're consuming to very low levels. That means you can't eat fruit, you can't have colorful vegetables, you can't really have to limit dramatically the vegetation you're eating. That means you're narrowing your phytochemical exposure, beans, things like that. So you're changing the bacteria you develop in your gut and these, it's these high phytochemicals that really enable slowing the aging process. We're talking about maintaining your telomeres, maintaining stem cells, the CERT1 proteins and the AMP kinase proteins that extend longevity we talked about earlier are fueled by phytochemicals, moderate caloric restriction and exercise. So the phytochemicals especially, you know, so when, when you're reducing phytochemical and antioxidant exposure on a ketogenic diet, using more coconut oil, avocado, you know, meats or cheeses or whatever it is you're eating, you're cutting out the plant carbohydrates. The question is, maybe they're right. Maybe the people on a ketogenic diet are right and their hypothesis of not eating plant carbohydrates and eating more just fat is better. Okay, if they were right, then we have to go to the videotape and go to those three criteria again and say, you know, there, are there studies that are long-term with large numbers of people, 
going on for decades, looking at hard endpoints, and the answer is yes, there are. Those studies are out now, and they show that those people shorten their lifespan. What I'm saying right now is the studies show that as people reduce the plant carbohydrate in their diet, to be, to be more ketogenic, they have a shorter lifespan, higher rates of cancer, higher rates of dementia, things like that. So we're talking here about um, all the evidence is overwhelmingly consistent in showing that the wide assortment of colorful plant foods leads for a longer life. There's not, the only inconsistencies is with individuals touting these diets and pulling studies that aren't looking at um, long-term hard endpoints. Your diet is called the Nutritarian diet. That's a new word for my listeners, my viewers. Can you explain to them what the Nutritarian diet is? Sure. We're just making sure we check every box of, of um, and include all the foods that have been shown to extend lifespan. So a Nutritarian diet means it's rich in nutrients, and we recognize that the quality of what we eat affects our future health and our longevity. So a diet that's less healthy can't make you live longer. A diet that's healthier and has more nutrients in the amount of nutrients we get per calorie and a diversity and full and completeness of all nutrients humans need. So once it's designed to be nutritionally complete, making sure we're not marginally insufficient because the body will triage nutrients to its immediate needs and reproduction and reproductive needs and not towards longevity proteins. In other words, the RDI for vitamin K is 140 micrograms. Most people consume less than 100 a day. But a nutritarian diet of all the vegetables and beans and gives you about 1,500 to 2,000. Is this too much vitamin K? No, we're not taking vitamin K. It's normal. That's what you get in the diet. But in other words, the extra, the body is not just enough for its immediate needs. It has enough for its, its, its long-term needs. It doesn't just triage to what it needs to be. We're not taking the minimal amount. We're taking the minimal amount of not vitamin C to not just get scurvy, the minimal amount of niacin to not get pellagra, that's not ideal. The word, ideal level isn't to just not be sick. It's to have robust, great health. So we're a nutritarian diet. We're eating foods that have a high nutrient per calorie density. And I'm also suggesting that when you have nutri when you achieve nutritional excellence, it naturally suppresses your appetite and makes you comfortable and desirous of the right amount of calories. So you can't become overweight. So you're not having you're not feeling weak and fatigued and headachy and crampy. You're not you're not driven to overeat calories needlessly just to feel okay. You don't want to eat until you get hungry because real hunger is associated with higher taste sensation and salivation, and it makes eating taste great. Furthermore, you know, we've style and vegetarian diet to make it taste incredibly delicious. And people's taste buds get stronger over time and they enjoy eating this way. So a person who's doing it for a while and love eating this way, why not live along and be protected against heart disease and cancer? I'm saying that we landed the man on the moon. What I mean by that is that we already know how to not, we already know how to win the war on cancer too. We know how we can wipe out breast cancer and prostate cancer and colon cancer. But, and the main answer is vegetables, but people don't like the answer we found. They're looking for a different answer. They want to have a magic pill so they can smoke three packs a day and not get lung cancer. People are always looking for a pill, like giving women folic acid to prevent neural tube defects in, in the, while they're pregnant instead of eating a diet that's rich in folate. That's a permission slip. It's an enabler to have people not have to eat green vegetables, which then increases your risk of childhood cancer, childhood brain tumors, childhood auto autoimmune conditions. We've damaged our children by giving them a folic acid pill to prevent neural tube defects. If we had instead advised our, our um, you know, our, the age, you know, the, um, advise young women who are of childbearing age to eat beans and green vegetables to get sufficient folate, we'd be killing three birds with one stone. In other words, we'd be preventing neural tube defects, we'd be preventing breast cancer in the woman in later life and the child, we'd be reducing risk of autism, brain tumors, and the leading cause of death, of course, other than accidents in children, is acute blastocytic leukemia, which is linked to the lack of green vegetables and the consumption of luncheon meats and processed meats, even two years prior to conception. So the eggs live in the woman's body before the babies are conceived and what women eat before conception affects the health of their future children and trying to take pills so they don't have to eat greens. You can still eat processed foods and fast food and take a folate, pit, folate acid pill is scamming people because now they're not recognizing that their diet is inadequate 
to have a healthy child. And when they have an unhealthy child, they weren't given the opportunity to prevent it. They didn't know. Nobody told them. They just want to take a bite a folic acid pill. They didn't say you have to eat green vegetables if you want to get pregnant. Since we're talking about uh, babies in the womb right now, uh, you have some experience treating some problems with fertility, for example, a PCOS. Can you tell us about your experience treating that? Yes. Well, there's a lot of varieties of PCOS, and some people just have PCOS because they're overweight, more insulin resistant, and it throws off their hormones. But your fat cells, when you're overweight, fat cells throw off a lot of inflammatory compounds and free radicals. They put off a lot of cytokines, and they, because of that, they raise aromatase production, which increases estrogen production. Therefore, it's messing up with people's estrogen progesterone ratio and interfering with fertility too, but the extra estrogen also increases the risk of breast cancer. And when an excess aromatase inhibit, inhibit, um, activity, you can have 10 times the amount of estrogen stimulation to breast tissue than in the, than it's in the bloodstream, dramatically increasing the risk of breast cancer. There's a link between you know, overweight, PCOS, breast cancer, you know, and extra estrogen and prostate cancer in men for the same reason. A nutritarian diet not only makes you lose weight, and gets those, that dangerous fat off your body. But the beans and greens and mushrooms and onions have anti-aromatase effects. They have anti-angiogenic effects. So they're anti-fat storage. They, re, they reduce and, pro, and prohibit the production of excess estrogen. And they make you more insulin responsive, so your insulin levels are lower too. So there's, there's a lot of reasons what going on. But yes, PCOS, it's easy to reverse. My wife, for example, we first got married, was told she had PCOS and she was not overweight then but just because she didn't eat healthy, but nevertheless, she was told she could never have children, you know? But, um, but many, obviously we have four children, you know, so we had never had a problem getting pregnant, but, um, but yes, it helped many women with PCOS and diseases like fibromyalgia, where people have body pain all over the body. You know, we do the combination of, of flooding their body with nutrients, as well as some regenerative neuromuscular therapy where we just, um, which just compressing the tissues, allowing blood to flow in and out and getting the lymph and blood to move in and out of, of tender and, and spasm tissue. And then when, that, when you get good nutrients flooding in with, that, with a nutritarian diet, the body heals itself and the people feel better and they rec make full recovery. So it's just very exciting what we're able to accomplish. And the fact that, just think about it for a minute, all the millions of people suffering with multiple sclerosis, with rheumatoid arthritis, with lupus, and the end of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, these diseases kill people. People die of lupus, and they die being, when they're given the drugs that these car carcinogenic medications that people have to take, and they're not told that nutritional excellence gives them an opportunity to get well, and that's been most thrilling for me. You know, and so, so when people come to me, I'm confident. I have the experience. I know that I've seen so many of these people make change their lives and got well again, and I can give people that hope, but it's based on reality, experience, and the fact that our body doesn't want to be sick, it'd be given the perfect raw materials it wants to get well. I mentioned at the beginning that we would be talking about a diet that would help with brain fog, attention deficit, deficit disorder, anxiety, and depression, basically a diet that helps the brain. Uh, is, is this the diet? Well, that's right. I mean, it's well established now in the scientific literature that commercial baked goods and fast food is a major cause of depression. The studies show even two servings a week of commercial bakers because of the lack of nutrients. So we're talking about these processed foods and fried foods and barbecue and grilled, you know, grilled meats and things have n nitrose amino compounds and heterocyclic amines and all types of, you know, um, in other words, pro-carcinogenic compounds and inflammatory compounds that affect the brain. And who's talking about the explosion of mental illness in this country that parallels the explosion of the fast food movement? And we know that right now in the scientific literature, the link between fast food and depression is more solid than the link between lack of parents, abusive parenting, social isolation, poverty. All these things don't associate as much with depression as does high glycemic carbohydrates, commercial baked goods, and fast food consumption. And we see, the, we see when we feed people better, their depression gets better too. So we have a, how should you say, a protocol to help people. And, we, and, and you know, when people come into my facility and they stay there for a few months, and they lose weight, they get rid of their diabetes and high blood pressure. They, you know, they get rid of their heart disease and they always say the same thing. The fog in my brain lifted. I can think more clearly. I'm happier, I'm more creative. They all respond the same way. I didn't just lose the weight, 
I'm not just feeling better, I'm thinking more clearly. My brain is working right now. They all say that. And you just mentioned your facility. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yes, I opened up a, a, a beautiful facility that takes people, so I can accept people to stay with me for two or three months. And these people sometimes could be food addicted, and it's very hard in their own environment some, for some people to follow the program. They're too um, pulled by their food triggers and by food addictions, by the social, by the negative social environment, by extracting them and putting them in my environment and showing them how to make the food taste great and teaching them the recipes and giving them the count the psychological counseling to get rid of their whatever trauma that's been affected where they used food as a for emotional um, you know they may be using food as a solace or for emotional um, wellness or for stress but that but we're talking about here that food it like penetrates the brain and can control people just like cocaine can control people and they can't break out of that prison so I have a safe place where people can come and stay a while and get rid of, and get rid of their prison get out of their prison of food addiction and fast food retrain their taste buds to prefer to eat healthfully watch the weight pour off their body and then be able to go home with their medical problems resolved and other and then by the time they do that, they've changed, they've changed their whole personality. We say it's not what's happening on your tongue, it's what's happening up in your cerebral cortex that makes you unable to eat healthy. And people learn to like the food, they enjoy know how to make it, and they can continue the progress. We'll give, I'll give you an example. Um, one woman was over 400 pounds and she, could, she tried dieting, always could never stick and gained it back again, even gained back more weight. So after she stayed with us for a few months and lost 50 pounds, the year she went home, she lost 150 pounds. So she lost 200 pounds in that year. What I'm saying is that by the time she left after a few months, she was a different human being with a different outlook on life, with a different personality. And we knew that when she was ready to go home, she could do this and she'd never be any other way because she loves eating this way. She loves how she feels. She enjoys the food now. She loves the recipes. And she wouldn't, you know, it's like they, she wouldn't consider going. So, in other words, for some people, they need more help than just reading a book. Now, I've helped millions of people with books and videotapes, of course, but some people need that's not enough for them. And I wanted to put together a facility where I could feel confident I could help those people in need who, who just, and there's so many people that need help like that. So I'm excited about this because, you know, for me, it's such a thrill to watch people get better. I think it's, in, I think many other people would, would find it a thrill too. I always say I'm giving people superpowers because once they get well themselves, right, they have the power now to help other people. And it's so rewarding to be a role model and to help other people in your community to get to get well and to, you know, and enjoy being healthy and well. It, that, it, this is really a blessing. People not, might not realize it, uh, that you are one of the OGs of, the, of fasting. You, you wrote, you co-authored a book on fasting, fasting and eating for health. And, you know, these days, if people don't know, fasting is a, a fad. I didn't co-author it. it oh, was, you didn't? I, it's just my book. Oh, it's There's your no book. book. Okay. Oh, so for, forward by Dr. Bernard, right? Oh, is it was a forward. By, okay. Okay, forward. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay, so it's your book. All right. Um, so, you know, that was written, how many years ago was that? 15, 20? No, that was written in 1994. 94. Yeah, so that, that's quite a while ago. 25 and, years ago. 26 and, or 27 years. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah, it's a long time ago. You're, you're one of the originals. It shows you that I have long I've been doing this. Yeah, exactly. So I was in practice numerous years before I wrote that, too. You know, I was. Wow. Well, could someone like me, you know, I've been told I could probably withstand, you know, I'm pretty light. Uh, I could withstand a seven day fast. Uh, could someone like me come to your facility and do a supervi a medically supervised fast? You could, but I'm but I wouldn't necessarily be recommending that. Um, it depends because some people I do have that, like some people with rheumatoid arthritis or asthma or lupus, it can or it can help me get them off the drugs and and get their inflammation down. Um, but for most people that are overweight, we don't we want them to learn how to eat and learn how to live. So they're losing weight between two and three pounds a week and they know exactly how to make the lunch and exactly how to make the dinner. And they, they want to keep that going two or three times a week because if they, it's not good if they start to become too radical because their weights, their metabolic rate slows down too much and their weights start, they start jumping on and off diets, under eating, over eating, under eating, over weight. Yeah, we want, when the people start losing weight, we want to eat this way. 
that the benefits are consistent. They're losing the weight every single week. And when they leave us, they keep it going at the same rate. They know what they've gotten. They know what they were achieving and what they were eating. And they know how to make the foods. They picked up their favorite recipes. They learned the recipes how to make them. They can go home. They can reproduce it. And they can do exactly like they were doing it when they were with us. So they keep losing two to three pounds a week until they get to their ideal weight. So we don't want to confuse this and make it too complicated. Right. You know? Okay. Um, there are some individuals where fasting can be a benefit. And then and in those cases, I can supervise, I do supervise that. Okay. What's a good first step for someone who's hearing this for the first time and just wants to get started maybe on their own? Well, I want them to get information because they're going to make too many mistakes on their own. So I'd like them to read one of my books. A simple, a good simple starter book is The End of Dieting because that really gets into the emotional eating and the psychological and the addictive eating and why it's so hard to make the dietary change and, and the tips and tricks how to be consistent and not, and not going on and off the diet, just eating for great health, eat to live a long time, and the weight will, will gravitate towards the healthiest weight. So I think it's a great place to start. The, uh, the answer to your question is, though, they, I want people to make a big salad every day with tomato and onion and, you know, and, and, and a dressing that's healthy made of way of nuts and seeds in it. It might be an orange whipped with cashews and sesame seed and, and blood orange vinegar or lemon. It might be some tomato sauce with almond butter or or, you know, or tomato sauce with, you know, balsamic vinegar and a few raisins and roasted garlic. And I, in other words, learn some of these healthy dressing recipes, have a giant salad for lunch and a bowl of vegetable bean soup or a chili. Make a big pot of vegetable bean soup on the weekend. And then you can have aliquot it out into different containers. You can take it to work with you. In other words, lunch is the most important meal of the day, not breakfast, not dinner. It's lunch. That should be your largest meal of the day, and that should be your, your, your eating a lot of vegetables, a lot of beans, and you're having a dressing made with nuts and seeds, because that's the meal. You're out of the house. You can be tempted by other foods around you, and we should be trying to eat lighter and smaller meals before we go to bed at night, so we go to bed on an empty stomach. We shouldn't be eating big, heavy meals at night. You know? So if people can get the lunch right, that's going to be the, the biggest first step, and it'll start, it'll start on their trajectory for great health. That the book you just mentioned, or did you just mention fast food genocide? No, you didn't. Uh, you mentioned, book. You mentioned the end of dieting. End of dieting. Yeah. Uh, in fast food genocide, you, you really focused on, I thought you focused on the brain quite a bit. And I, did. I did. And that was my most recent book is fast food genocide. And I, th I personally, you've read that, have you? It's, yes. I think it's, yeah. It's, I think it's my most interesting book. Actually. It is. It's really a great book, but I don't, but because it doesn't focus as much on a personal losing weight, and their own individual problems. I think that's why it doesn't sell as well as my other books are have sold. You know, I yeah, it's a history book. I, I think in many ways. In some ways, but it's also very motivating for people to eat healthfully, and very motivating for people how, how to make the change. And there's, it is, it does really. I, people who've read it have really been like the final, you could say, tipping point to make them go over to be a nutritarian. So it does really help people make those decisions. But you, that's really interesting. So I am, I am advocating people read that book definitely, even if they feel they don't. They, that the end of dieting is more appropriate. And why can't people read two or three books? You know, they this is their this is their life is on the line here. This is their whole future, and they should get as much information as they can. I'd like to take a moment here to apologize to Dr. Furman and my audience for the way that the interview ended. It ended with technical difficulties. Uh, I'd like to publicly thank Dr. Furman here for having been on the show today. And if you are interested in books and other resources by Dr. Furman, the best place to go for those would be drfurman.com. The link is in my show notes. Furman is spelled F-U-H-R-M-A-N, and for doctor, it's just D-R. So drfurman.com. I'm licensed marriage and family therapist Thomas Schmier, and you've been listening to The Healing and Peace Show. To find out more about my worldwide services, which includes therapy or life coaching that's inspired by Dr. Furman, visit healingandpeace.com. To keep informed about future show guests and topics, subscribe to my blog at healinginpeace.com slash blog. You can find my social media handles at healinginpeace.com and healinginpeace.com slash blog. 
Thanks for watching or listening today. Until next time, may God bless you with healing.